Okay, so today's video is on a process called homeostasis. It's the balance that our body maintains internally. So let's go ahead and get started. Here's kind of an analogy of homeostasis in your home. Here's the floor plan of someone's home. And usually centrally located on the wall of your home is, uh, is a thermostat, which helps to control the temperature inside your home. And maybe tucked away in the back of the utility room is the furnace. Well, connected to the furnace are all the heating and air conditioning vents. And the, thermos, the, thermostat, and the thermostat and the furnace are connected to one another by a wire. Well, let's say that you have the temperature in your home set for, 30, uh, set for 77 degrees Fahrenheit. But because it's a really cold day outside, maybe the windows are open, it's only 74 degrees inside. So the thermostat will turn on and send a signal to the furnace. The furnace will respond by producing heat. That heat will be poured and pumped out of all the heating vents until eventually your home begins to warm back up 75, 76, 77 degrees. At that point, the thermostat will stop sending a signal to the furnace. The furnace will stop producing heat because the home is back to normal. A great little analogy of homeostasis. Well, homeostasis then is the process where the body maintains a constant internal environment. The reason this is so important is because of all the internal chemical reactions that are proceeding right now in order to keep you alive. The chemical reactions that are happening right now, for instance, you know, they all take place in a 98.6 degree body or a 37 degree Celsius body. And if our body temperature gets too high or too low, many of those internal chemical reactions do not proceed as effectively or as efficiently as they should. And so we have control systems in place to adjust our bodies whenever a change is occurring. So besides temperature, which is probably the one that everybody knows, other things that are controlled besides temperature would be, for instance, our blood sugar. Our blood sugar's percentage is about 0.1% of our blood sugar. And if that gets too high or too low, we can suffer side effects. Same with blood pH, a pH of 7.35. If our blood pH gets too high or too low, we can suffer side effects as a result of that. So a moment ago, I mentioned that the body has control systems to, to cause change. And well, what are these control systems? Well, we can break it down into a few categories. Control systems are made up of, of sensors or receptors. Receptors gather information about the body and the environment. In this case, there are thermoreceptors in the woman's hand that are gathering information about the candle that she's uh, getting too close to. So heat is being detected by the thermoreceptors in the woman's hand. Well, then we have what's called the communication system. And it's a series of nerves where messages will be sent throughout the body. So the nervous system is part of your communication system. And in this case, an electrical signal called an impulse is going to travel from the woman's hand, from the sensors in the woman's hand, up to her brain. Well, they're going to the brain because the brain is what we call our control center. It receives information from all the sensors. It receives information from the eyes, from the nose, from the hands, from the feet, from the tongue. And ultimately, this is the brain. The brain is our control center. It receives the impulse from the woman's hand in this case. Well, finally, the brain has to tell the body to change its action. And so the brain is going to send a signal to what's called the target. In this case, the target is the woman's hand. You know, if she was stepping on something sharp, the target would be her foot. But in this case, she's touching something hot. So the brain is sending a signal back to the woman's hand that will cause her muscles to stretch and contract very abruptly and perhaps even shout out a few uh, colorful words. But all these control systems here are designed to maintain a constant internal environment. And one of the trademarks of homeostasis is what is called negative feedback. This is what regulates most of the body whenever a change is occurring. And it's the process where your body will reverse a change that is happening. You know, in this animation here, this child's been stuck outside in the cold temperature. And 98.6 degrees is our normal body temperature. And as the temperature, uh, as your body temperature drops and this child gets colder and colder and colder, eventually they're going to get so cold where their body begins to shake or shiver. 
Well, shaking and shivering is designed to generate heat. When your muscles stretch and contract rapidly and violently as they do in shivering, they rub on one another and that generates heat. And that eventually will warm you back up. Notice how that's an example of negative feedback. The change that was happening is that the kid was getting too cold, but negative feedback reversed the change and warmed him up. Well, the opposite of true is true also. If you're at the beach too long and you're outside in the hot sun, notice how the woman's body temperature is beginning to rise. Eventually, if the body temperature gets too high, she'll produce little droplets of sweat all over the body. Well, how does this actually cool you down? How does sweating actually cool you down? When the sweat evaporates, it takes heat away from the body. And as more and more and more sweat is produced and evaporated, more and more and more heat is taken away from the body. Eventually, you get back to normal. Great examples, again, of negative feedback because your body worked to fight the change and reverse the change to get you back to normal. So another great example of negative feedback is what happens when you hold your breath. You know, if you hold your breath, carbon dioxide begins to accumulate in your blood because you're holding it in. You're not getting rid of it. Well, when that happens, your brain is alerted that there's too much carbon dioxide in your blood. And your brain's going to respond to that. Your brain will send out hormones through your blood. The hormones are going to go to the muscles of your diaphragm. Your diaphragm is the muscle in between your ribs that helps you breathe. And when, you're, when you're, uh, your diaphragm receives these hormones from the brain, the diaphragm is going to relax, forcing you to inhale and exhale. You can only hold your breath for so long. Eventually, uh, negative feedback is going to cause you to take breaths again. Well, if there's a process called negative feedback, there's probably going to be the opposite, something called positive feedback. And this is a process where your body doesn't stop the change. Your body will actually encourage or promote a change that's happening. And so this is important when a rapid change is needed. One of the best examples of this happens when a woman's about to give birth and she starts to experience pregnancy contractions. Contractions are when muscles in the uterus begin to stretch and contract, ultimately trying to push the child out, trying to give birth, trying to deliver the child. Well, what happens is there's a nerve in the cervix that will send a signal to the brain. The brain will receive that signal and will send hormones all throughout the body. The name of this hormone is called oxytocin. And so ask yourself, well, if this was negative feedback, if this was negative feedback, what would happen next? Well, if this was negative feedback, the body would try to reverse and stop those contractions. But if that happened, the baby would never be delivered. So negative feedback is not the proper solution in this example. The body is going to respond with what's called positive feedback. Positive feedback encourages the change. Those hormone, that hormone called oxytocin actually helps to speed up and encourage the muscle contractions. That way the child will be born even sooner. So the process of homeostasis. It's really a team effort. There's a lot of body parts and body systems working together. And that's the point of this slide. I want to briefly go over what's called thermoregulation. Thermo is a prefix that means heat or temperature. So this is the process of specifically maintaining your body temperature. Well, you have nerves, you have sensors in your skin to detect whether or not you're hot or cold. In this case, we're going to detect cold, that the person's cold. And so the nervous system is then next going to be used because the nerves in the skin are going to send an electrical signal to the brain through the nerves to the brain that requires the use of the nervous system your brain is then going to respond by sending out chemical hormones into the blood hormones are all part of your uh, hormones and glands are part of your endocrine system so now your endocrine system is involved those hormones are going to be received by the muscles of your body. So now we're including the muscular system. And ultimately, it's the muscles that are going to begin to shake and shiver, ultimately causing you to warm up. A great example of what I mean by your body works together, that there's a lot of cooperation between body parts. Well, every now and then, our body will experience disruptions to our normal levels of fluids and temperatures so homeostasis can become disrupted 
you know, most of the disruptions are temporary. We've all had infections and fevers and sore throats. And, you know, in the picture, if you do enough pull-ups, sure, you're going to have muscle soreness a little bit later in the day or the next day. You know, these are all fairly temporary. You know, we've all had infections where we've, you know, had fevers and we've had to just, you know, lay in bed for a couple of days. Eventually, our immune system fights off the infection and we feel better. Well, not all homeostatic disruption is temporary. Sometimes it's permanent. Here's two examples of frostbite. You know, this person, I don't know if it's the same person or not, but the person's hand and the person's uh, fingers in this example, they clearly were exposed to cold for too long. And you can see that the, the cells of the toes are beginning to turn black. They're, they're dying. And ultimately, the sensors in the toes aren't going to work anymore. The cells are dead. They're not going to be able to send or receive signals from the brain. So homeostasis is going to be disrupted simply because there's no communication between the toes and the fingers that you also see. And often we can even see major disruption uh, and it would lead to par paralysis. This is where messages from the brain never reach the target. You know, normally the brain will send a signal from the brain down to, let's say, the feet allowing you to walk or, or move or kick a soccer ball or move up steps. You know, that's how it's normally supposed to happen. But if there's some kind of injury, let's say the at the X location, this person um, had, a, had a broken spine as the result of, a, of an automobile accident, the brain can still send a message down to the person's foot. The problem is the, the message never gets to the foot. It never gets past the injured site. So this is an example of a person who would be a paraplegic. They wouldn't be able to move below their waist. So even though you can put a ice cube on their, on their foot, the, the, the signal never gets to the brain. Or the brain can try to send a signal to the foot, saying, you know, wiggle the toes, but the toes never receive that signal. And this is an example of being a paraplegic. If the injury is higher on the spine, this could be a lot more devastating. The brain can send a message, but it never again gets past the injury site. In this case, the person could be a quadriplegic, where quad means four. They don't have the use of their four limbs, two arms and two legs. And so, again, this is a more severe injury in that the person has less use of their body. But great example of homeostasis disruption because signals are not being sent. There's no communication below the injury site. You know, sadly today, one of the growing causes of homeostasis disruption is the disease diabetes. Well, before we go into diabetes, let's kind of discuss how the process is supposed to work in a normal, healthy person. So here's a bunch of cells, and cells need glucose. Glucose is the food or the fuel that cells are going to take in. And so the mitochondria will use the glucose to make ATP, which is an energy molecule. And so after meals, the amount of glucose begins to rise in our blood. And so we see a bunch of G's have just popped up. These, this is the glucose that's risen in the person's blood. And when the blood sugar, the blood glucose gets too high, an alert is sent to the brain. So the problem lies in those little doorways, those little cha blue channels that you see that are, remain, that are in the closed position right now. When the brain receives the alert that the blood sugar is too high, the brain is going to send a signal to your pancreas. The pancreas will then release a hormone called insulin into your blood. The insulin will attach itself to these little channels, these little doorways, and the insulin kind of acts like a key. The insulin will cause those channels to open. So now that the channels have received insulin, the channels begin to open. One by one, they begin to open. And I hope you see what this is going to allow. This is going to allow the glucose to enter the, the cells. Glucose will diffuse from the high concentration in the blood to the low concentration in the cells. And there we see the glucose moving from high concentration in the blood to the low concentration in the cells, giving the blood, excuse me, giving the cells much needed nutrition and lowering the amount of glucose back down to its normal level. 
Well, especially here in the United States, we have a growing problem with type 2 diabetes. But diabetes in general, type 1, type 2 diabetes, has a few things in common. First of all, cells need glucose because, like I said a moment ago, the mitochondria are going to use that glucose to make their energy in the form of ATP. So anytime you have a meal, glucose begins to rise in the bloodstream. And as we see glucose rising, a person must have just had a meal. And so like we saw a moment ago, now that this person has elevated blood sugar, there's an alert that will be sent to the brain. And just like the last time, those channels, those doorways are in the closed position. So your brain will receive an alert that the blood sugar is too high, and the brain will send a signal to the pancreas. Now, depending on what type of diabetes you have, type 1 or type 2, uh, what I'm going to say for now is that a damaged pancreas will often release too little insulin. And so here you see just a small amount of insulin being released and a couple cells, a couple channels receive insulin. And so a few channels in my animation can at least open. Well, that, that'll help to take in some of the glucose from the blood, just not enough. So now that a few of the channels have opened, at least a little bit of glucose can diffuse from the blood into the cells, but not enough to bring the level back down to normal. And so the glucose now, and that's the problem, is that the glucose level in the blood never returns to normal. And so as the hours go by, eventually a person's going to have another meal, which is going to add even more glucose to the already high amount of blood sugar. And so here, here you see hours have just gone by and a bunch more G for glucose is being added to the person's blood. Now we have a really major alert going to the brain, too much blood sugar. But again, the pancreas is just not releasing enough insulin to open these channels. And so ultimately, the cells begin to starve. I should say ironically, the cells begin to starve, ironically, because there's food on the other side of the channel. There's glucose, which is food for the cells. But ironically, the cells begin to starve because they just can't get the glucose. And as the glucose level rises and rises and rises, that alters the pH of blood sugar. The blood sugar becomes acidic. Normal pH is around 7.35, a very weak base. But when the amount of glucose begins to increase, it goes into the acidic range. And these are some of the negative health effects of a lifetime of diabetes. So one of the ways that, of course, we can try to combat diabetes is through proper exercise and proper diet. Now, if, you're, if you are a diabetic, there is a form of treatment. So when it comes to the treatment of diabetes, you know, if a person's pancreas is not producing enough insulin, well, then let's provide insulin for that patient. They can take at-home insulin injections where they literally inject themselves with a needle and inject insulin directly into their blood. That will allow those channels to then open, and one by one when the channels open, the high amount of glucose that's in the person's blood can diffuse into the cells. And over time, the blood sugar comes back down to normal. So there you go. I hope you have a good, solid understanding of what homeostasis is all about. If you're in my biology class, you know, try to answer these questions on a separate sheet of paper. I'd be happy to check your answers either before school or after school for accuracy. So go ahead and try these for review and let's see how you do. Uh, good luck.